Hi, my name is John Bennett. I'm the progenitor and founder of the John Bennett Journal. And I post my videos on YouTube under Bandershot. Bandershot is the word I've given the fifth phase. It's the term or the label that's described the fifth phase of matter. And this journal is about, um, this is all about me and what I think about things. And I don't care what anybody else thinks, what I think. This is what I think, so, so there. Anyway, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, light speed today. Uh, I want to ask, I want to pose a question. Oh, by the way, I should, probably should first talk about what, what I've been doing. I spent the last week in um, Marin County down north of, of San Francisco. And I am enchanted. I've been living most of my life in Portland, Oregon, just down the road from where um, Linus Pauling is bur buried. One of my great inspirations is Linus Pauling, quantum chemist, the guy that practically invented quantum chemistry, won two Nobel Prizes all on his own some. And he got the first one Nobel Prize before he graduated high school. Do you believe that? I mean, you know, you stumble across some cool things every now and then, but that's got to be one of the coolest things in my life. And I'm just down the street. I've visited his grave in the Pioneer Cemetery in Lake Oswego, Oregon. I'm just down the street from it. And he didn't graduate from high school. So... I mean, he went to college. I think he went to the OSU college. Hey, I'll, I'll post a picture of him in my in my journal, and you can. Here's Hudson. Say hi to everybody, Hudson. Tell everybody how much you love him. Come here, Hudson. Hudson Larue. Oh, now he's over here. There he is. Say hi to everybody. Give him a big smile. Thank you, Hudson. Hudson is my floor director. He takes care of everything that's on the floor. He says, come on, Dad, let's go. I don't want to hang around here anymore. Get out and move. He loves to go for walks. He yanks at the leash, and then he stops to smell something, and I yank at the leash, and it gets to be a big tug of war. Anyway, Linus Pauling won two Nobel Prizes. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Hudson. Now I don't remember what I was talking about, where I was going with it. Anyway, so this has been a this has been some inspirations here, but it's nothing compared to to Marin County, down north of San Francisco. It should be Maven County. Call it Maven County. All the Mavens are down there. I mean, they it's just huge. It's culture. It's it's progressive. It's liberal. People are smart. People have lots of money. And it's a big, it's a great place for homeopathy. And I had one of these rare opportunities to meet one of the great medical minds of our time. Um, well, I don't want to, I don't want to overbake this thing. But I met a really good homeopath, and uh, I don't know what kind of physician you'd call you'd call her. But uh, anyway, so I went down to study with her and uh, give Dana Ullman a hard time at Berkeley. And I want to move there. I've been living in Portland, Oregon. I guess that's why I started off talking about Linus Pauling. I've been raised in, born and raised in. Portland, Oregon, thereabouts, roundabouts, different parts, lived in different houses and stuff. Well, it's Portland, Oregon. I've been a few places in the world, but I spent most of my time here. And it's time for me to move. I really want to move and get, get amongst some, a different level of people. And, I, and the people down there in Marin County are really smart. So, so pray for me. <laughs>
send me a prayer. I can. I want to move to Marin County. Fairfax would be one, would be just right. Marine Mammal Center's study center is down there just off the coast. Just on the coast down there. Well, of course, it'd be off the coast. But anyway. <laughs> um, the sea lions down there are getting leptospirosis. And I don't know if, how many people know this, but the Cuban government destroyed leptospirosis a, as it appears in their annual epidemic of it. And this was back years ago, several years ago now, as I fondly remember. The Cuban government, this is before, you know, before we went back in there to sent the mob back in there, the mafia, just recently. I mean, you know all about that stuff. <laughs> anyway, the Cubans stop their annual leptospirosis epidemic using super molecular medicine, using ionic liquids. I'm not, I'm not giving you their putative name because everybody goes, oh, geez, it's, you mean that? So I would like to see the Marine Mammal Study Center down there in Pismo Beach or wherever the heck it is. Um, see if they can cure this leptospirosis epidemic among the sea lions using using leptospirosis no sode, an energetic extraction of the leptospirosis bacteria. You know, we've done it. Ben Benice did it and, and others replicated it. The basal field degranulation test. There have been biochemical tests done using these materials. Use, okay, I'll say the word, used in homeopathy. The world is really passing up some, some amazing stuff because they profess not to understand the chemistry of it. But the chemistry has been plumbed by people like Lonnie Spalling, Royal Copeland, Nobel Prize winning scientists like Montagnier. I don't know if he gets the dissociation part because there's different phases to this, but it's completely explainable in modern scientific terms, what the action of these materials are and we're not using them properly or to the extent that we could be using them in medicine. It's really kind of stunning. The I hate to say ignorance, but it is an ignorance of the use of these materials. These materials have been used by homeopaths to stop all kinds of diseases. And there's a long record of it in the literature that's supported by the FDA. So there's no re good reason for us not to be using these things in epidemics that are hitting the sea lion population, for one example, or the leptospirosis problems that they're having in Puerto Rico from the hurricane. I mean, come on, scrape it together, everybody. So I need to go. I need to go to Marin County and and do my thing. And I want you. I want some help. I need some sponsorship. I mean, like Uri Geller told me, he says, I'm not a super rich man, but you know, I'm doing all right. But I'm not doing as well as, as <laughs> I don't have Uri's millions. I've just got a few bucks. You know, I'm a, mendic I'm a mendicant. I don't really want to deal with, with having big sums of money. I just, wanted, I just want to see my project succeed and not starve to death. You know what I mean? I mean, I'd like to live in a nice, nice place down in, you know, I could, I could, a studio apartment or something would be fine if I could just get down there and, well, actually a big house would be better, but <laughs> whatever I can get my hands on, get, I want to get down there. You know, so my life is going by. I'm 66 years old and I'm falling apart. Mostly from the grief that I get from every, that I've had from well not everybody but <laughs> it seems like everybody just about everybody 
So please, please, come on. Come on, loosen up. Come on. Help me. Help me. So anyway, did I say that my name is John Bennett and I uh, have the John Bennett Journal at WordPress.com? JohnBennett.WordPress.com. And I post these videos on Bandershot. If you want to, if you want, if you're crazy enough to want to see more, Bandershot on YouTube. Bandershot is the is the uh, fifth phase of matter. Did you know that? There's a fifth phase of matter. See, look, there's four classical phases of matter that everybody knows or should know and doesn't of matter. There's the solid phase. There's the um, the liquid phase. There's the gas phase, and then then it's, this it's not the third one. It's the, the it's the fourth one. It's the plasma phase of matter, and matter shifts through these phases willy nilly. But there's a fifth phase of matter. There might be more. A classical phase. I mean, you know, every every tin cup physicist wants to come up with another phase of matter, you know, the Einstein boson phase or something like that. But that's bullshit. I'm talking about a classical fifth phase of matter that can be explained to people. <laughs> that's the fifth phase, which is the immediate phase of matter. So matter goes from an immediate, in other words, the universe, look, the universe is 14 billion years old, right? The size of the universe is uh, in parsecs or light years. We want it in light years. The diameter is 20, is 93 billion light years old. So the, we can see out the, of the observable universe Oh, and I'm starting to panic. 48, we should be able to see 48 billion light years out, but it's only 14 billion years old. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me somehow. I'm trying to figure the math on this, and it's not exactly adding up, is it? I don't know. It's 14 billion years old, and we, but we can only observe... 48 billion years, light years out. Light year being the distance light travels in a year. So here's the thing is that the, is that it's too, con, it's too confusing. We're seeing that starlight, those distant stars pretty much real time. Because, listen to this, because Light has no barriers to it outside of gravity. They're measuring light in the thrall of gravity from the sun and the earth. And time actually speeds up. Time speeds up when you, as you remove yourself from the gravitational field. So the, the, the less gravity the, there is, the less time there is. And what's happening is, is that the electron, the electron God, is coming in from the outside, it's manifesting itself. As it slows down, it hits the gravity, it, it begins to condense into a center which then becomes, because of this intense gravitational, what we see as a gravitational field, which is basically electrons getting all gooey, you know, collecting and acquiring density and giving off heat and a little bit of light and coming back out again as, as heat. And so the, that's what the, what's going on with the sun. They say, well, it's a nuclear reaction. Well, whatever, I guess maybe it is, but they don't seem to have, an, modern science doesn't seem to have the ability to look from the 
inside out. We look, we talk, we talk about things going in, in well, we talk about the, the electron coming from the inside of the molecule or the atom, right? But we don't think about what's going into it. So anyway, the point is, is that gravity, gravity screws up these equations. As you get less gravity, you get more speed. And so it speeds up in, in to instantly. How do we know this is true? How do I know this is true? Because of what they call quantum entanglement. In other words, you separate a particle. You take a particle. I, I don't know how they do this. They pull it apart. One's over here and one's over here. Suddenly, they're all acting, this, acting the same. There's, there's no... They seem to be connected no matter how far apart they are, presumably entirely across the side of the universe, which just blows all of this time stuff to hell. But they, you, don't, you don't see them copying to that. You know what I mean? Well, anyway, the, um, the, the comet is a good example of of what we would regard as molecular dissociation. This is one of the things that's holding back homeopathy is the misunderstanding of what molecular dissociation is and how it plays into the creation of the remedy. There's basically five steps to the creation of the homeopathic remedy of the solution. First is tritiation. This is grinding the particulate solute particulate with milk sugar so as to separate it this, and get it into very as fine particles as possible using a, uh, you know, a mortar and pestle. I have one here somewhere. Where's my mortar and pestle? <gasps> I've got several actually. Oh, here it is. Mortar and pestle. This is the first step of the homeopathic remedy preparation. The more, here's the mortar and here's the pestle and you put the uh, milk sugar in there with a little bit of the solute and grind it up into little bits as far as possible as, as much as possible this becomes a dry the dry solute well this is what's added a little of this is added to uh, another round of that so you dilute it dry dilute it even more you're separating these particles and refining them down as small as they'll go. This is the law of the cosmotrope. That that order will center around the smallest the smallest entity, as opposed to the chaotrope, which says that which will create disorder in a field as the center of the field. Okay. So um, that's the first step. Is the first and second step of tritiation is uh, grinding this in the smallest particle. Then it's, it's wet diluted, a tincture is made of it, and then that is diluted one to 10 or one to 100 usually in either decimal or centesimal dilutions. And at the sixth dilution, there's a phase change. This is the molecular dissociation phase. This is when molecular dissociation, you can look this up on the, uh, on, this is according to Google now, the same people that gave us the age of the universe. Screwed up age. There's, it's unknown that the unit, listen, the universe could be as close as your eye. Do you understand what I'm saying? The universe is immediate the, is in both time and space. The, the universe is, is in the immediate phase. In other words, it, everything is happening right now. And you can go through the fifth phase. By means of the fifth phase, you can cross the universe instantly. That's human potential. So anyway, in the dilution phase, by the time you get to the sixth decimal dilution, Parts per million are one part per million, one part solute per million parts of water in, in this dilution. At that point, there's a nuclear event. 
that occurs with succussion, which is the particle explodes into electrons. This is molecular dissociation, and it happens like that within either, I mean, approximately or theoretically by the sixth dilution. But some, some things might take longer, but it has to get down to a part, one part per million. Why is it that we say one part per million? Why don't we say one part per billion? Because one part per million is, is, is as small as it can get in the relation to the water molecule. At that point, it explodes and, create, and turns into plasma. And as mass decreases, what happens? Energy increases. So you have this flow, sudden flow of electrons through the, through the electrolyte, through the solvent, the water solvent. And it's forming structure within the solvent. It's formed through the hydrogen bonds of the water molecule. So it forms these very intricate and detailed shapes and forms of fernels and sheets of interlocking crystal. That's the crystallization of water, the liquid crystal of liquid water. There are these ice crystals that, that form electrically linked to the what's called the hydrogen bond, which is an energetic bond. I don't think there is any breakage. I think it's vibrating. It's a waveform at that point. Do you understand that there's no breakage of these bonds? They're going from one to another, zopping around like lightning on the ground. So that's the uh, that's the magical moment in the homeopathic remedy is the sixth dilution on the average. By the seventh, it's the particulate has been euthanized. And it continues to expand through succussion, which is the, the next step, is this tremendous amount of pressure that is put on the insides of this little vial of water and post-solute. Tremendous amount of pressure, it gets up to 10 kilobars of pressure, which is enough to explode these particulate and also keep bringing in energy from outside. So it's transducing the energy that's brought in from succussion and it's maintaining the electronic structure of the solute through these hydrogen bonds. And it's beginning to become radioactive. It's in other words, it's, it's putting out, at this point, it's putting out energy. It's detectable. It's been detected at 200 beats a second, I think. I think that was at Kant, Roland, the Roland Kant team did it. They detected what essentially is tritium, the tritium signal, which is radioactive hydrogen. What do you think of that, baby? Radioactive hydrogen, the radiant signal is what works here, is what's, is what's motivating matter, is the electron. It's not a mechanical process, really. It's a dynamic process. It's not a, it's not a particulate, it's a wave. So at that point, you end up with tritiation. That's, that's uh, trituration, grinding the, the solid in the mortar and pestle to tritiation, creating the uh, creating the dynamic field. And that's how the, that's how the, the uh, that's how it works. Well, this is your first degree, I guess, in, in the uh, course offered by the University of the, of the Infinitesimal, UI. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in my video. I'll talk to you later.